So again, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Um, we've been discussing the chapters um, successively from the teachings of Lord Chaitanya, a very wonderful book by Shri Prabhupada, which is based on uh, the Chaitanya Charitamrita. That is the authorized biography of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Um, so I pray for all your blessings, for the justice, for this great work, so that we can have a better understanding of the Lord and his pastimes. Of course, we always pray for the blessings of our spiritual masters as well. So we will um, recite some prayers to them. Vinasya <laughs> So this 23rd chapter of the teachings of Lord Chaitanya is called Why Study the Vedanta Sutra? So the Vedanta Sutra is a very important work by Srila Vyasadeva um, by which we actually understand um, three processes that are essential to spiritual life. Um, we said that those three processes are Sambandha, which is um, the actual understanding of who we are and who God is. Um, then there's Abhideya, acting according to um, that understanding and that action is of course through devotional service and Priyajan, the attainment um, of the goal of spiritual life which is pure love of God. So although um, this is very clearly enunciated in Vedanta Sutra, um, according to impersonalist philosophy, um, the Vedanta Sutra has a very different meaning and so the impersonalist at the time of Lajitani Mahaprabhu's pastimes had studied the Vedanta according to that impersonalist meaning um, given by Adi Shankaracharya, the great um, impersonalist philosopher. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had um, very mercifully defeated them and having accepted his um, wonderful explanations on what the Vedanta Sutra actually are about, the sannyasis had asked him to explain further, having developed a taste for hearing. So um, we have been going through the Lord's wonderful explanations to them, specifically um, through um, the first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam. So how does Srimad Bhagavatam tie into Vedanta Sutra? Well, simply, Srimad Bhagavatam is the actual commentary on the Vedanta Sutra. That is, the Vedanta Sutra explained in its most personal way through the past tense of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in all his various incarnations. And then, of course, um, in his original form in the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. So, as with all scriptures, the first verse is um, the actual um, the verse that encapsulates the actual meaning of the text. And so this um, discussion on the first verse is essential for us to understand um, what the meaning of the Srimad Bhagavatam and therefore what the meaning of the Vedanta Sutra is. So we'll continue with our discussions on this first verse. We just chant the invocation prayer. Jaya Jaya Shri Chaitanya Jaya Nityananda Jai Jai Chandra Jai Gaur Bhakta Vinda Jai Jai Shri Chaitanya Jai Nityananda Jai Jai Chandra Jai Gaur Bhakta Vinda Jai Jai Shri Chaitanya Jai Nityananda Jai Jai Chandra Jai Gaur Bhakta Vinda The translation of this verse is Glory to Shri Chaitanya and Nityananda Glory to Advaita Chandra and glory to all the devotees of Shri Gaur Bhakta Chaitanya This verse is verse 18 of the first chapter of the Chaitanya Jai So um Understanding, of course, the relationship of um, all the scriptures that we mentioned now, Srimad Bhagavatam, Vedanta Sutra, um, and of course, their um, their relationship to this first verse. We also understood the Vedanta, the Srimad Bhagavatam to be the explanation or the expansion of the Gayatri Mantra. Okay. Um, this we discussed a few chapters back. So it means that this first verse of um, Srimad Bhagavatam is encapsulating the meaning of Srimad Bhagavatam. Since Srimad Bhagavatam is um, the commentary on Vedanta Sutra, this verse is also um, encapsulating the meaning of Vedanta Sutra. And since the Srimad Bhagavatam is an expansion of the Gayatri Mantra, um, 
this first verse is also an expansion or an explanation of the Gayatri Mantra. So this first verse is quite um, important and uh, and Devala Chitani Mahaprabhu is explaining it very wonderfully to these, um, to these impersonalist philosophers. Um, significant, of course, is that um, when an explanation is authentic, as a Srimad Bhagavatam is an authentic explanation of the Gayatri Mantra, that actually becomes the same as the mantra. And so as the Gayatri is the Lord in song form, Srimad Bhagavatam is the Lord in literary form. Um, this is also more about the significance of Srimad Bhagavatam. Um, we will dip into that a little bit um, by saying that many great authorities um, not only in the Vaishnava tradition, but in other traditions as well, have cited the Srimad Bhagavatam on different occasions. Some of those authorities include um, Shripad Madhvacharya, the great Acharya of the Brahma Madhva um, Sampradaya, which is our parent Sampradaya, or our parent um, chain of uh, disciple succession, as well as um, the most respected Parashara Bhatta, uh, the father of Srila Vyasadeva himself. He also has um, cited Srimad Bhagavatam, and um, Srivedanta Deshika, uh, the great Acharya of the Sri Vaishnav line. Even the guru of Sri Pashtankaracharya, right, the great Mayavadi philosopher, his spiritual master called um, Sri Godapada, he also cited Srimad Bhagavatam, believe it or not, in his works. In addition, of course, our great Gaudiya um, Acharyas, right, and Lachitani Mahavaru himself, um, the crest jewel of sannyasis, he has cited Srimad Bhagavatam, he has extolled and preached. Um, the glories of Srimad Bhagavatam extensively. Um, and from this we understand that the Srimad Bhagavatam simply cannot be um, um, in any way considered in inferior scripture to um, the other Puranas, for example, or even the Vedic literatures as some um, modern day so called scholars hold. Um, we understand that for Srimad Bhagavatam to be quoted by all these great philosophers, it means that Srimad Bhagavatam must be most respected because we also discussed a few classes back that um, the scholars would engage in a lot of um, high profile, very public and uh, no holes barred debates by which they stood to practically lose everything. <laughs> so they would have to only um, speak from a site from the most authentic and the most um, reliable, respected um, sources of knowledge. Of course, Shriman Bhagavatam being cited by so many is evidently one of those sources of knowledge. Um, and further than that, even the rivals of these Vaishnava Acharyas, like we stated now, um, the great Mayavadi philosopher Sri Gaurapad, as well as um, the Shaivite philosophers would also quote from Shriman Bhagavatam. Um, in addition, there are many reputable commentaries on Srimad Bhagavatam, more than 30 um, very reputable uh, centuries old commentaries, as well as um, even greater number than that, um, including Sri Prabhupada's wonderful commentary in modern times. Um, and some of the respected ancient or um, acharyas of old who have commented on Srimad Bhagavatam include Sri Pachanka Acharya from the Madhvacharya line. Um, Sri Vallabhacharya from the Kumara Sampradaya line. Um, from the Smarta line, we have um, Sri Swami. We know uh, Lord Shaitanya Mahaprabhu had quoted Sri Swami quite extensively, and that Sri Prabhupada has also quoted Sri Pad Sri Swami um, in his uh, purports to Srimad Bhagavatam. Um, we also have Sri Vaishnavas like Sri Pad Vedanta Deshika, who's also um, produced a commentary on Srimad Bhagavatam. And of course, in the Gaudiya Vaishnav lines, we have our beloved um, Srila Sanatana Goswami, Srila Rupa Goswami, Srila Jiva Goswami, right? and many others. So, um, Srimad Bhagavatam is greatly respected, all these acharyas to have produced commentaries on it. And further, um, by, uh, by a very interesting fact, Srimad Bhagavatam is also the most complete of all the Puranas that um, we have presently. So, how do we know this? So many authors have cited different Puranas 
But if one had to actually look for the those verses within the the copies of the Puranas that we of the, the other Puranas that we have today, we'll find that those verses are actually missing, meaning that um, much of those Puranas are missing. Um, some would say about sixty percent actually. But if one looks for um, the quotations from Srimad Bhagavatam that other Acharyas have cited, um, we will find that all those quotations are present in the edition of the Srimad Bhagavatam that we have. Um, even some apparently disputed chapters um, from Canto 10, there's three that um, some from the Sri Sampradaya and the, I think Madras Sampradaya say that were not originally there. Um, that's chapters, I think, 12, 13, and 14 of the 10th canto. Even a verse from the, that 14th chapter is quoted by Sri Pachankaracharya's Guru, meaning to say that basically all parts of the Srimad Bhagavatam are authentic, right? um, further adding to its um, great credibility. So the Srimad Bhagavatam has been preserved in its entirely uh, more so than any other of the Puranas. Then, of course, um, there are the glorifications of the Srimad Bhagavatam from the other Puranas. And this is um, quite nice. Sri Prabhupada mentions that the Matsya Purana, which is actually the oldest Purana, glorifies Srimad Bhagavatam. Um, then the Skanda Purana has a section called the Vaishnava Khanda. And there, in that Vaishnava Khanda, there is a further section that is um, dedicated to glorifying the Srimad Bhagavatam. Um, this is in the Margashisha Mahatmya. Um, let's read one verse, two verses from there. O son, a man who reads with mental and physical purity, a shloka of the Bhagavad Purana every day, attains the merit of reading all the 18 Puranas. Vaishnavas stay there where my story is continuously recited. Those men are unaffected by Kali, who always honor my Purana. Okay, very beautiful. Then in the Brahmanda Purana, um, Lord Krishna is described as Shuka Vagha Mutab Hindu, right? the moon from the ocean of Amrita or Nectar, um, which is what Shuka Deva Goswami's voice is compared to Amrita. Um, and that is, of course, a clear reference to the Bhagavad Purana or Shaman Bhagavatam, because this is where Shuka Deva Goswami speaks about Lord Krishna. Um, in the Padma Purana, there are three full chapters in the Uttarakhanda, which is another section. Um, this is from chapters 193 to 195 that glorify Shriman Bhagavatam and explicitly refer to it as the speech of Shukadev Goswami, which it is, of course, and a source of knowledge on Krishna, the best source of knowledge on Krishna. So, of course, it means that we should not take any um, heed of the so-called modern-day scholars speculators and, uh, and other authorities who question the Srimad Bhagavatam, um, we can see that it is the most respected and ancient scripture um, that is directly about the Supreme Personality of Godhead and directly about the goal of life. So um, I must give credit to a Vaishnava writer called Venkatanath Sutta for a lot of this information here. And now we can continue with our readings on chapter 23 um, about this wonderful first shloka, the first verse of Shrimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 1, Text 1. So we'll just recap what we've discussed so far. Um, from the first line in which um, Krishna is clearly referenced, um, we have read, O my Lord, Sri Krishna, son of Vasudev, O all-pervading personality of Godhead, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. So we had said that Krishna here is being referred to as Vasudev. Right, with the accent on the first um, vowel A. And whereas all um, the forms of the Lord can be called Vasudev, as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the other meaning of Vasudev is the son of Vasudev, in which case not all the other forms of the Lord can actually be referred to in that way. It is only Krishna and his first expansion, Lord Balaram, who can be referred to as the sons of Vasudev. Um, but we also said that Lord Balaram is a very special position because he actually is um, identical with Krishna. The only difference is their color. So um, this verse can refer to the both of them um, specifically. Um, 
And we also discuss further that the next verse, sorry, or the next line um, is about how Lord Krishna is the ultimate creator. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth and the primeval cause of all causes of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universe. Lord himself states this quite clearly in Srimad Bhagavad Gita as it is, chapter 10, text 8, when he says that he is a source of everything that is created, material and spiritual. We also discussed that very foolish people think that because they don't see the Lord creating anything, he um, can't be taken as the creator. Although we also understand from the very nice analogy that Shri Prabhupada um, gave us, that um, as much as we can't think that the chief engineer of a big construction company or the CEO of a construction company would be there laying bricks um, on the construction site to prove his existence. In the same way, we cannot expect that God and all his greatness and power would be personally um, creating things to prove himself to us, that he wouldn't come up with more sophisticated ways to um, cause the creation, the maintenance, and the destruction of this universe to happen, which of course he does, which is what Srimad Bhagavatam explains quite extensively um, to us. So um, we have to therefore understand through the scripture uh, about the nature of the Supreme Lord rather than um, following those who demand to see everything before their imperfect eyes. And this is how we had concluded last week and now we will continue um, with the next lines or the next line. Uh, I think we'll only get through this line um, today which states he is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. So the rest of the verse says, It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji, the original living entity. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion as one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen in fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes, temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature, the actual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. So just backtrack this line that we're discussing today. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations and he is independent because there's no other cause beyond him. Okay. So we will read more from our text. In actuality, from Brahma down to the insignificant ant, no one is independent in the material creation. The hand of the Supreme Lord is everywhere. All material elements as well as all spiritual sparks are but emanations from him only. Whatever is created in this material world is as a result of the interaction of these two energies, material and spiritual, which emanate from the absolute truth, the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, Vasudev. So we said um, that Krishna states in the 10th chapter of Bhagavad Gita that he is the source of everything material and spiritual. We, of course, are spiritual, and this entire material creation is material. Um, the fact that um, it is emanating from Krishna means that it is dependent fully on him. Although, of course, um, science, atheists would have us believe that this material creation is existing on its own, producing everything on its own, independently. Um, there are many, many arguments, um, strong and powerful arguments we can make against this. But, of course, the one that um, we usually cite is that we have no evidence, no proof in this world of any wonderful creation, any um, efficient mach machine that works without having a creator. There's nothing that we can offer that's analogous to this extraordinary machinery of the material creation working perfectly without there being a creator. So the interesting thing is that whereas the scientists have absolutely no proof, nothing to even offer to show how anything can exist without a creator in order for us to believe that this uh, material creation is existing in the same way, still we put more credibility in them. Still we trust more of what they say, um, simply 
addressing it as science and and so more believable than the statements of the Supreme Lord himself. Um, indeed, we do have people before us extolling these theories, but we also have people before us lying, cheating, stealing, hurting us. The fact that people are providing proof of their existence, um, but also providing proof of their, um, well, their lack of credibility should make us question more the things that they say rather than believing more into it. Right? The only reason we would fall into that trap is because we're all under illusion and Maya is that strong. A living entity known as a chemist can manufacture water in the laboratory by mixing hydrogen and oxygen. But in reality, the living entity works under the direction of the Supreme Lord and all the materials he uses are supplied by the Lord. So not only is this entire material universe created by him and under his control completely, all our bodies, which are little microcosms of the universe containing the same elements and working under his direction also, are not independent of him either. Every single one of us, whatever we are doing from morning to night, is under the direction of the Lord, whether we realize it or not. So we actually can't claim our ability to do anything as our own, neither can, can we claim any of the elements that we need to carry these things out as our own either. Everything is being supplied to us, um, from the elements that we're using to the elements that these bodies are actually made up of. Yeah. Um, we're actually extremely helpless, so the Lord is providing everything for us, everything um, in this entire universe, um, and all beings are actually needing of this. Um, not just the human beings. Um, Sri Prabhupada says all the way down to the germs. So it means that the Lord has to be present um, with all of us to guide us and direct us, to give us um, those abilities that we have as well as to provide for those abilities. Um, and so it, he's also present um, in all the atoms of everything as well, right? not just in living things, but also in things that are apparently not living. Um, so this is how we understand how rocks are able to form sand, how water is able to flow forward, how wind is able to move from higher to low pressure, how sunlight is able to travel. Everything is under the control of the Lord because he's pervading everything right into the atoms. Thus the Lord knows everything directly and indirectly in minute detail. And he's fully independent as well. Right? So these two important qualities that we're going to discuss today or we are discussing today the lord being conscious of everything abhigyaha is the term and being completely independent is um, referred to as swarat in this verse so the lord um, is not just the source of everything but he's actually present everywhere and this is something that's beyond our comprehension because we can only imagine that for someone to be present everywhere, they would actually have to be divided everywhere. But the Lord is um, not just able to be present everywhere, he also remains the original person at the same time, existent as the verse, uh, this verse states in his eternal abode. So this is how he can directly be aware of everything as himself, the original person, as well as indirectly by being present everywhere at the same time as the super soul. It's a little inconceivable, but this again is within the purview of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Right. Um, he can be situated everywhere in the material world as well as being in the spiritual world at the same time. Um, we are only conscious of our bodies, but to be supremely conscious, right? Krishna also explains this, explains this in the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord is conscious of everybody at the same time. Um, this is what Abhigiha actually means. It's only something that Krishna can do, to be conscious of everyone, everywhere, all at once. Okay. Let's discuss what Swarat means. He can be compared to a gold mine, and the objects within the cosmic creation can be compared to ornaments made from that gold, such as gold rings, gold necklaces, and so on. The gold ring and necklace are qualitatively one with the gold in the mine, but quantitatively, the gold in the mine and the gold in the necklace or ring or necklace are different. The complete philosophy of the Absolute Truth therefore centers about the fact that the Absolute Truth is simultaneously one with and different from his creation. 
nothing is absolutely equal to the absolute truth, but at the same time, nothing is independent of the absolute truth. So we understand that this philosophy, of course, is Achintya Beda Beitakva, um, the perfect synthesis of all the Vaishnava philosophies given by Lachitani Mahaprabhu. Um, it explains that everything is coming from the Supreme Lord and is therefore one with him in that way, yet at the same time it has a completely different existence and therefore it is also different from him. Um, all of emanations of the Lord have some qualities of his, but only he possesses all qualities in full. And so we all have uh, a little independence to act, but only he is fully and supremely independent. Um, this is um, a quality, again, that only the Supreme Personality of Godhead can possess. Um, something that is very essential to our understanding of why we can't uh, realize ourselves to be God or realize ourselves to be the Supreme Brahman. We will discuss this in a little while. Conditioned souls from Brahma, the engineer of this particular universe, down to an insignificant ant, are all creating something. But none of them are independent of the Supreme Lord. So Lord Brahma is creating uh, entire planetary systems. Um, he is doing the most extraordinary work for the Supreme Lord. And the ant is producing a little ant heap. But whatever the work may be, it's all being done under the control of the Supreme Lord. And nobody is independent of the Lord. Right? Everybody needs everything from the Lord. From the creative ability that they have, to the actual ability through their physical bodies that are made up of energies of the Lord, to every other thing that they require from the material nature. The materialist wrongly thinks that there is no creator but his own good self. And this misconception is called maya, or illusion. Due to his poor fund of knowledge, the materialist cannot see beyond the purview of his imperfect senses. Thus he thinks that matter automatically takes its own shape, independent of our conscious background. This is refuted by Srila Vyasadeva in the first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam. As stated before, Vyasadeva is a liberated soul and he compiled this book of authority after attaining spiritual perfection. So we must be realistic now. In the material world, we have a lot of people consider themselves authorities on spiritual matters, on matters of creation. Right? They could be scientists, they could be scholars and so on. But the reality is that most of them um, are struggling right, in academia to make it. They're waiting for that lucky break. They're waiting to be favored by somebody so that their theories or their, um, their works will be recognized. Right? They're depending on funding, which they may or may not get. Then if everything works out, they may be able to test some hypotheses or um, some theory, um, which will only be reliable to a certain degree, which will be flawed in some way, which will be subject to complications, which will be open to improvement, right? This is all the reality of the material world. And then even when it is proved to be somewhat successful enough to be released to the publish, public, it's exploited to make someone rich. This is the way of the material world. This is the way of science. Um, the exploitation may even render that creation or that knowledge um, somewhat inaccurate right? or, or almost completely um, affected in some way or the other because prophets usually speak. So this is a science that we have faith in. This is what we want everything to be tested against. And yet Srila Vyasadeva, who is a perfectly realized soul, who had to still, despite being, being an expansion of the Supreme Lord, undergo so much of austerity to prove himself, to develop his perfect spiritual vision before he even sat down to wrote Srimad Bhagavatam, his expertise is questioned and disregarded. Um, Srimad Bhagavatam itself actually explains all his qualifications in which he, um, sorry, all the qualifications that he possesses in order to write scripture of this caliber. Um, we're quoting now from chapters uh, four and chapters five, chapters four and five of Canto One. Shri Vyasadeva knew the essence of all religion. He underwent strict disciplinary vows, unpretentiously worshipped the Vedas, the spiritual masters, and the altar of sacrifice. He abided by the rulings um, and also showed the import of disciple succession through the explanation of the Mahabharata, by which even the fallen can see the path of religion. 
He was fully equipped with everything required by the Vedas. His inquiries were full, his studies were also well performed, and he prepared a great and wonderful work, the Mahabharata, which is full of all kinds of Vedic sequences lavishly explained. He fully delineated the subject of impersonal Brahman as well as the knowledge derived therefrom. His vision was completely perfect, his good fame spotless, he was firm in bow and situated in truthfulness, and he was also able to think of the past sins of the Lord in chance for the liberation of people in general from all material bondage. He had perfect vision and knows the Supreme Personality of Godhead because he is actually present as the plenary portion of the Lord. Although he is birthless, he had appeared on this earth for the well-being of all people. Who else's CV is going to be able to compare to that? So this is the qualifications of Srila Vyasadeva, right? And therefore, Srimad Bhagavatam, in another um, reference, this is from Canto 1, Chapter 1, Text 2, states that he is Mahamuni, and Mahamuni Krite, he wrote, Srimad Bhagavatam, Srimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite, after he had attained the status of a Mahamuni. Once again, we ask, how many of the so-called authorities who dismiss Srimad Bhagavatam can be called even a Mahamuni, so that they can dismiss Srimad Bhagavatam as the state of producing something equivalent? Since the complete whole or the absolute truth is the source of everything, nothing is independent of him. In one sense, everything that exists is the body of the absolute. So we trust the words of Srila Vyasadeva who tells us this, that everything that exists is acting as, as an extension of the Lord being his energies. Therefore, in the same way that my body is an extension of me and therefore it is not independent of me and it acts under my control, everything in this creation, including us, is not independent of the Lord and is acting under his control as well. Any action or reaction of a part of a body becomes a cognizable fact to the embodied soul. Similarly, since the creation is the body of the Absolute Truth, then everything in the creation is known to the Absolute, both directly and indirectly. This is very clear. In the Shruti Mantra, it is stated that the Absolute Whole, or Brahman, is the ultimate source of everything. Everything emanates from him, everything is maintained by him, and at the end, everything enters into him again. This is, that is the law of nature. This is confirmed in the Shruti Mantra. There it is said that at the beginning of Brahma's millennium, the source from which everything emanates is the absolute truth, or Brahman, and at the, the end of that millennium, the reservoir into which everything enters is that same absolute truth. So whether it's the Shruti mantras, which are coming from the Vedas and its corollaries, right? we said that Shruti means that which is heard, or whether it's the Smriti mantras, which are coming from um, the Itihasas, the Puranas, and Smriti means that which is remembered, all these scriptures support each other, and support the Srimad Bhagavatam's conclusion about the Absolute Truth. And he had also said that there is congruency in all these writings, um, all produced by Srila Vyasadeva. Um, especially in the Bhagavad Gita as it is, um, we have a, a very nice situation that helps us understand um, that the Absolute Truth is speaking about himself and his abilities. Um, in the other scriptures, in the Shrutis and the Smritis, it is usually someone speaking about the Absolute Truth. And even in the Bhagavad Gita, it is Arjuna speaking about the Absolute Truth. But what is also nice is, and, and probably unique as well, I could say, is that the Absolute Truth himself is speaking, and he's also corroborating that which Arjuna is saying. Okay? So what does Arjuna say? Chapter 10, text 12. Param Brahma, Param Dhamma. Pavitram Paramam Tavan, Purusham Shashvatam Divyam Adi Devam Ajam Vibhum. Sri Prabhupada's word for word translation is Krishna is Param, Supreme, Brahma, Truth, right? The Supreme Brahman. Param, the Supreme Dharma, one who sustains all. Pavitram, completely pure. Paramam, Supreme, Person, sorry, Bhavan, referring to Krishna. Purusham, Personality, right? Shashvatam, Eternal. Divyam, transcendental. Adi Devam, the original Lord. Ajam, the unborn Lord. Vibhum, and the greatest. Right? There's pretty much no room for interpretation there. And again, we say that Krishna himself states in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 10, text 8, that he is the source of all. Material scientists haphazardly take it for granted that the ultimate source of the planetary system is the sun. 
but they are unable to explain the source of the sun. So now Sri Prabhupada is stating um, something about the, the theories of modern science. So there's a little bit of, um, of uh, okay, we're trying not to go too much into it, but basically there's a, a theory, of course unproven, because none of these theories about creation can actually be proven in any way, that um, there's a cloud of, uh, of matter that forms after this apparent Big Bang, and from this cloud collapsing on itself because of its forces, um, matter within it kind of condenses to form the sun, 99% of that matter for, uh, for that uh, understanding, and that everything else becomes a sort of a rotational disk around the sun, and that's what all the other planets, including the Earth, form from. So whether one believes this, or whether one believes the Vedic version, Still, there's no explanation as to um, the ultimate source of where this matter comes from. In the first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam, the ultimate source is explained. According to the Vedic literature, Brahma is the creator of this universe, but because he had to meditate to receive the inspiration for such creation, he is not the ultimate creator. As stated in the first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam, Brahma was taught Vedic knowledge by the personality of Godhead. There it is said that the Supreme Lord inspired Brahma, the secondary creator, and enabled him to carry out his creative functions. In this way, the Supreme Lord is a supervising engineer. The real mind behind all the creative agents is the, supreme, is the absolute personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. So even if the scientists want to say that it's the sun that's the source of everything, the sun still has its source from Brahma, who has created it, and Brahma has his source from Krishna, who not only creates him, but inspires him and instructs him on how to create. In the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, text 10, Sri Krishna himself states that it is only, that is he only who superintends the creative energy, Prakriti, the sum total of matter. Thus, Srila Vyasadeva worships neither Brahma nor the sun, but the Supreme Lord, who guides both Brahma and the sun in their creative activities. Right? So whatever way we look at it, Modern scientific or Vedic, Krishna is the source of all. Right? And something that he says repeatedly in all the scriptures. The Sanskrit words Abhigya and Swarat, appearing in the first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam, are significant. These two words distinguish the Lord from all other living entities. No other living entity other than the Supreme Being, the Absolute Personality of Godhead, is either Abhigya or Swarat. That is, none of them are either fully cognizant or fully independent, right? This we have established today. Everyone has to receive knowledge from his superior, even Brahman, who is the first living being within this material world. He has to, sorry, even Brahma, who is the first living being within this material world, has to meditate upon the Supreme Lord and take help from him in order to create. If neither Brahma nor the sun can create anything without acquiring knowledge from the superior, then what to speak of the material scientists who are fully dependent on so many things. Modern scientists like Jagdish Chandra Bhosh, Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein, etc., may boast of their respective creative energies, but all were dependent on the Supreme Lord for so many things. After all, the highly intelligent brains of these gentlemen were certainly not products of any human being. The brains were created by another agent. If brains like those of Einstein or Newton could have been manufactured by human beings, then mankind would produce many such brains instead of eulogizing those these scientists. If such scientists cannot even manufacture such brains, what to speak of foolish atheists who defy the authority of the Lord? So indeed, it's not just the brain that needs to work. The brain needs an entire body to support it. Um, it needs knowledge from some external source. Everyone is taught by teachers in order to um, achieve the um, glories that they did. All these scientists needed equipment, they needed housing, they needed assistance, they needed funding. Right? All of these things come from the Supreme Lord. It's not just enough to, in better commas, have these brains, but even those brains are coming from the Lord himself and no one can just manufacture them. Even the Mayavadi impersonalists who flatter themselves that they have become the Lord are not Abhigya or Swarat, fully cognizant or fully independent. The Mayavadi monists undergo a severe process of austerity and penance to acquire the knowledge needed for becoming one with the Lord, but ultimately they become dependent on some rich follower who supplies them with requisite paraphernalia to construct great monasteries and temples. 
Not this much we have definitely seen. In fact, in the modern day, the Mayavadi philosophers tend to align themselves with politicians. Those have become um, very popular to support them and sustain them. So either way, they're never fully independent. And what to speak of cognition? None of them, whoever claims to attain self-realization, can be cognizant of everything in creation all at once. But neither being Abhigya, neither being Swarat, they can never actually realize the God within or merge into God or any of the things that they claim to be able to do. And this is why we must never be fooled by them, um, never be fooled by uh, the atheists, the scientists, the speculators, or so-called philosophers. So thank you all so much for your kind attention. We will continue our discussions on this wonderful chapter next week. Are there any questions or comments? Anything that I can try and clarify? There none. Um, we will go on to seeing Avena's Pajana Bhashanati Radharani. We are in preparation for her wonderful appearance that is coming up next week. Um, we've just come out of um, the uh, the celebrations for the appearance days of um, Lord Krishna and Sri Prabhupada. Um, these were very wonderful, helped increase our consciousness of the Supreme Lord. And um, we actually we we need the blessings of Srimati Radharani to be able to do that. Um, Shrimati Radharani is um, the energy of the Lord that brings him pleasure and she also gives us the ability to bring the Lord pleasure because she guides us in our devotional service to him. Um, we, we pray intensely for her mercy and her blessings to us to help us um, to be able to, um, to please the Lord and her mercy incarnation of course is the spiritual master. Um, and so by serving him, we can also do Shimati Radharani. So we will sing this bhajan. Um, it's on the chat for now. Radhe Jaya Jaya Mahabhi Radhe. If I put it on the screen. Thank you so much for that. Radhe. Radhe. Jaya Jaya Mahaprabhu Dante Radhe Jaya Jaya Mahaprabhu Dante Gokul Tarni Mandala Mahite Gokul Tarni Mandala Mahite Radhe Jaya Jaya Madhava Dante Radhe Jaya Jaya Madhava Dante Ramadana Rati Pardana Veshe Hari Nisvita Vinda Vithi Neshe Ramadana Rati Pardana Veshe Hari Nishtha Vinda Vithi Neshe Radhe Jaya Jaya Madhava Dante Radhe Jaya Jaya Madhava Dante Ishapanu Radhe Jaya Shashi Lekhe Lalita Shaki Guna Ramita Vishanti Ishapanu Radhe Jaya Shashi Lekhe Lalita Shaki Guna Ramita Vishanti Radhe Jai Jai Madhava Dai Te Radhe Jai Jai Madhava Dai Te Tarnam Puru Mahi Tarnam Bhari Te Sanaka Sanaka Sanavani Tachari Te 
karanam guru mahi karuna bhari se sarasa sana sarvani sachari se radhe jay jay madhav jay 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 se sokul ka hrni mangal mahi te sokul ka hrni mangal mahi te radhe jay jay madhav jay se radhe jay jay madhav jay se jay jay madhav jay translation the refrain is o radha or beloved of madhava or you who are worshiped by all the young girls of gopal all glory is unto you all glory is unto you you who dress yourself in such a way to increase your damodar's love and attachment for you o queen of vrindavan which is the pleasure goal of lord hari o new moon that has risen from the ocean of king vrishabhanu o friend of lalita O you who make Vishaka loyal to you due to your wonderful qualities of friendliness, kindness, and faithfulness to Krishna. O you who are filled with compassion. O you whose divine characteristics are described by the great sages, Sanaka and Sanatana. O Radha, please be merciful to me. Shri Shri Radha Radha Ki Jai, Shri Rupa Goswami 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 Ki Jai. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Let me take a look at our Vaishnav calendar. I must apologize that I didn't double check this before we came in. I want to see if there's any other observances tomorrow. So, no, um, not until next week, Wednesday, um, when it will be Anati Sita Thakarani's appearance day. That one's out of Advaita Acharya. So, we'll discuss a little more about her then. Um, so, thank you all so much for your kind attention and. Um, I pray for Shmita Rani's blessings on all of you. Have a wonderful week. And join us next week for our discussions on this um, chapter 23. Shishantai, Gaur Hari Ki Jai, Shri Raghavad Ki Jai. Thank you all. Bye, Krishna.